This is BBC News, the headlines. A UN document seen by the BBC says the Taliban is intensifying its hunt for people who worked for NATO and US forces. It warns that the militants are arresting or threatening family members of targets unless they surrender themselves. The US says it's evacuated 7,000 people from Kabul in the five days since the Taliban took over. As people scramble to leave the country, the UN Refugee Agency warns of a looming humanitarian crisis. There's mounting anger in Haiti as aid agencies struggle to reach some of the areas worst hit by Saturday's earthquake. Over 2,000 people were killed. The authorities in Washington, D.C. have arrested a man who threatened to detonate a bomb near the U.S. Capitol. Police say that they do not know what the man's motives were. Hello and welcome to our look ahead to what the papers will be bringing us tomorrow. With me are the Times radio presenter Callum McDonald and the chief executive of the think tank Demos, Polly McKenzie. Tomorrow's front pages. Let's get stuck in. We start with the Metro, the desperate scene of a mother handing her daughter to an American soldier, begging him to save her from a life under the Taliban. On the front page of the FT, a photo of female protesters in Kabul carrying the Afghan national flag that's in show of defiance to the Taliban. The Telegraph reports on remarks made by the US president. That is actually the Guardian there, which leads on the story Dominic Raab refused to take calls during the fall of Afghanistan. And then we move on now to the Daily Telegraph, which, as I just hinted now, does report on those remarks made by President Biden. He hit back at Britain and other NATO allies, saying that they all had a choice to stay in Afghanistan despite the US pulling out. Let Let's get stuck into the papers as I move to the right camera. We're going to start and have a look with our guests at the Metro, uh, which is really, of course, the headline that stood out when we looked at all of these papers. Uh, Callum McDonald from Times Radio. Absolutely. I think the, this is the, one of the defining images now of um, this chapter of Afghanistan's history. Earlier in the week, we had footage of hundreds of people surrounding that US transporter plane, some clinging to the aircraft. Such was their desperation to get of actually the lives that millions, tens of millions of people in Afghanistan are now facing and how desperate they are to avoid that life. I think particularly for women, particularly for young, uh, young women and young girls, particularly for children who have had no experience, no knowledge of living under the rule of Taliban militants. Their parents, their grandparents are fully aware of what awaits them. And so this picture on the front of the Metro demonstrates the care, the concern, the anger, the anguish of parents as they try and get their children out to safety. Um, I think it also speaks to the chaos, the chaos of the situation that is probably largely unfathomable. Clearly, we see pictures, we see uh, video footage. But actually trying to coordinate this effort on the ground must be nothing short of a nightmare in terms of trying to get as many people out of Afghanistan as possible and as quickly as possible. Polly McKenzie from Demos, did we ever think we were going to get to the stage where the US and the UK were in charge of the airfields relying on the Taliban for perimeter security? No, I mean, this is extraordinary. And the speed with which it has happened is precisely what, you know, both governments in the US and the UK and more broadly told us wouldn't happen. Um, and it, it, I think, is it's so hard to even imagine how desperate you would have to be to, to even consider, let alone doing it, passing your baby over to soldiers in hope of securing the safety of that child. It's, you know, we see we see this desperation all over the world. We see people getting onto dangerous boats to seek uh, safety. We see people surrendering their safety to people traffickers and smugglers to get out of dangerous situations. And it, it you know, it's a, it's a reminder of the extraordinary privilege we have to live in peace and security. Uh, this is a mess. This is an iconic image. Uh, but for, you know, the, Callum says, you know, we ought to be trying to get as many people out as possible. And, and that's right, of course. But the reality is it's a, it's also a reminder of just how 
how limited our scope, our power is in these countries, which, you know, for a long time, the West acted as if it could just march around the world and, and fix problems, fix women's rights, fix democracy and change every country uh, in, in the image of the West. And what's clear from this is that that's just not possible. And even if we save three times as many as the people we're talking about saving 20,000, you know, the reality is that life for the Afghan people is going to get uh, immeasurably more difficult and less free. And there's almost nothing we can do about it. We saw that picture on the front page of the Metro. The Daily Telegraph, our next paper, has something quite similar. A picture on its front page of a British paratrooper with a child at Kabul Airport, uh, presumably inside the airfield, which means that that child and their family will be able to be uh, evacuated. The main story we're talking about, though, on the Telegraph, you can see there, is from the US president. UK and allies had a choice to remain. This Callum McDonald is from an extract that wasn't actually used, I understand, in the interview uh, Mr. Biden gave to ABC News in America, but it addresses that point made by a number of UK ministers and officials in recent days saying they had to follow the US. Biden saying no, they didn't. Yeah, and I think this is concerning on a number of levels, actually. So, uh, one, the implication that we had to follow the US. I mean, since when? Uh, why can't we move past that? Isn't that something, a thing of the past? Why couldn't we um, do this without the US? Joe Biden now saying um, in this report, as you say, from an unbroadcast uh, part of an interview with ABC, that actually everyone had their own choice. You know, you could do whatever you wanted. Um, I think the concern for me comes as well um, on a slightly different level in what appears to be a slight breakdown in communication between uh, leaders um, of different nations and also within countries. Um, so, at, first of all, it took us days to hear from uh, Prime Minister Johnson and President Biden. Uh, neither should escape criticism for the delay in hearing anything from them as Afghanistan fell over the last few days and over the last weekend particularly. But then also it has emerged in the last few days that just how sluggish world leaders have been to actually communicate with one another. Do they I don't not understand. have their own WhatsApp group, like the G7 world leaders, you'd think? That would be quickest. Yeah, literally. I mean, everyone else seems to use WhatsApp, don't they? Because then they can just delete the messages and we all, you know, can quickly move past any uh, parliamentary inquiries or whatever that might focus on those messages. It just seems bizarre to me that there is an apparent lack of communication between supposed allies. It makes me question what the point in these allyships is, what the point in even trying to have any diplomatic relation between nations is, when at a critical time in the history of the world, by the way, and Western nations intervening or not in this situation, actually, it's all a lot of who cares. President Biden's at Camp David, Dominic Rabs on a sun lounger somewhere in Greece. The whole thing just seems utterly devoid of any sense of leadership. Uh, Polly McKenzie, when we look at this point, the point made by UK ministers and officials in recent days was that the UK simply just does not have the air power to do this on its own, to provide the kind of air cover that the US was providing during the NATO-led mission. And therefore they say they didn't have a choice, but Mr Biden says they did. I mean, it's, of course, sort of technically true. We could have left some soldiers there doing some training missions. But the reality is that, you know, European nations went into this war, the original invasion, in support and in defense, in fact, of America. It has always been a US-led operation, and the US spends vastly more on its uh, defense and security than, uh, than European nations do, which means that we are actually, like it or not, incredibly dependent on, on that military relationship. And as, you know, m uh, ministers, backbenchers have been talking about this week, it's clear we need to reconceptualize our foreign policy for potentially a generational shift. It's something that Biden actually has quite in common with Trump, really, is a much more isolationist view of what the US both is capable of and also should be spending money on in terms of uh, spreading its power, spreading its influence around the world. You know, the Trump argued, convincingly in, in some ways, that in fact European nations should have been spending, um, that whether it's 2%, 3%, 4% of our GDP on defence so that we do have the capability to intervene um, more comprehensively and also more independently. Of course, the UK has uh, separated ourselves out from uh, common European approaches to these things by, by leaving the European Union. But there is still NATO, there's still opportunities there. But I think we're all going to have to adjust to this idea of a much less uh, interested 
America in global affairs and this shift eastward of power because the people deciding the future of Afghanistan will be uh, China and India, uh, you know, Iran, closer, more regional powers. Pakistan in particular, of course. Let's go back to that idea of who was phoning who, when, and from which location. That's what The Guardian is doing. It's really day two of this story, because we should say that the Daily Mail, uh, in the figure of Deputy Political Editor John Stevens, did have this story last night. Uh, it goes on to a second day. Rob refused to take calls during the fall of Afghanistan. Callum McDonald, the story goes on. Indeed it does. And I think um, the issue for Dominic Reb is that there is a focal point of um, a lack of leadership. That's the thing. There's somewhere to focus anger, dismay, uh, you know, concern. And it is the Foreign Secretary who, um, as it would appear from various sources being cited in various papers, including The Guardian's front page uh, and various people, you know, in a classic non-denial sort of situation. Um, the suggestion that Dominic Raab uh, didn't place a call to his counterpart in Afghanistan but instead delegated it out to uh, a junior minister. Um, I think uh, from the Foreign Secretary's point of view, um, the, uh, the Defence Secretary aptly came to his defence and suggested it wouldn't have made the blindest bit of difference anyway if the Foreign Secretary had placed the call. Um, I don't know whether that's true. I'm not sure what the diplomatic relationship is between Foreign Minister of the UK and, well, I guess the former Foreign Minister now of Afghanistan. However, I would like to think that our statesmen, our stateswomen, but in this case our statesmen, would actually care enough to be able to place the phone call, uh, to take 10 minutes away from the side of the pool or wherever, in fact, he was, and make that phone call to Afghanistan. I think I was struck by um, what one of my colleagues, Matt Chorley, tweeted earlier this evening, which was that news desks seemed better prepared for the fall of Kabul than the UK government did. Um, you know, it, which strikes me as bizarre. I don't understand why at news desks, um, at the BBC, at Times Radio, wherever else, newspapers are across the country, indeed across the world, actually had the scoop on this and our leaders did not. That strikes me as entirely bizarre. Uh, Polly McKenzie from Demos, uh, just looking at that wider issue, the Times, we don't have it right now, but they've run a story uh, similar to their saying that the permanent secretaries of a number of government departments are also on holiday at the moment. Uh, this does add to a story that began yesterday with the foreign secretary and is now the government's having to respond tonight saying, will permanent secretaries continue to take calls on their leave? Yeah, I think... You know, Ben Wallace is right that no phone call from Dominic Raab or anybody would have prevented the Taliban from taking Kabul or the, the collapse of the Afghan government. But again, in a situation like this, there's not much you can do to ameliorate the situation. But there are things you can do. And, and my view is that it is the duty of ministers and senior civil servants to make themselves available to for those essentially, you know, incremental phone calls or changes that will enable one extra family or 10 extra families who did service uh, to the UK government and to our allies during the, the last 20 years to, to get out, to get to safety. And I, I think somehow we, our government got captured by this sense of acknowledging the powerlessness, acknowledging the end of liberal interventionism and forgot that actually small things, small phone calls can really make a difference to individuals to whom we owe an extraordinary duty of care and obligation. And, and it's this idea that we need to limit applications and we need to make sure we're only offering a few thousand people just in case they sort of overcrowd some sort of asylum housing. It's actually, I think, it's, it's that mindset that we absolutely need to restrict rather than try and be compassionate and open-hearted in, uh, in the service of the obligations that we have developed over essentially 20 years of a, of a failed project. Just thinking back to government communications, the time where Peter Mandelson said he was running the country from his Blackberry abroad. There was a different time. The Guardian does have another story, which I'm just going to read us briefly. British Embassy Guards, you can see it there, ineligible for UK help. Callum. Yeah, so this is um, a report in The Guardian that about 125 um, guards who were guarding the British Embassy uh, are ineligible for help because they were hired through an outsourced contractor. 
Um, I think this is going to be uh, the start of perhaps a common theme here where a technicality means that we absolve ourselves of responsibility for people who have served and helped, um, in this case, just over 100 people. Um, maybe there will be a U-turn on this decision, who knows, but it feels like it's it's something of a, a bureaucratic thing where, oh, because you were an outsourced contractor, uh, it means that we actually we don't have anything to do with you. Um, and for me, that's going to leave a slight bitter taste, I think. Um, I think the suggestion that we can't help people is one that I struggle to understand, one that seems scarcely human, in fact. And I think that if people are looking to get out of Afghanistan, let alone if they've helped the UK in any way, as these 125 people clearly did by guarding the embassy, but if people are looking to get out of Afghanistan, um, I don't understand why we need to be so restrictive. Um, uh, you know, we went there, we've been there for 20 years uh, we are able to help. I, I just I don't understand how such a well-resourced nation um, of proud people who are willing to help. We have spoken on our radio station to local charities uh, in several uh, uh, instances this week who are standing by. They are saying they are receiving donations of clothes, of offers of help, you name it. People are standing by to welcome refugees from Afghanistan. And I just wish that we were a bit more open to that and open to moving people, including these 125 security guards, um, to safety. There are some more people who are taking a stand in Afghanistan. If we look at the front page of the Financial Times, we'll see there, Taliban tested defiance, says that article on the Financial Times on in Kabul streets, a demonstration, Paula McKenzie, led by women waving Afghan flags. Uh, it is uh, astonishing that the demonstration might take place at all. Yeah, I mean, it, it gives you some hope. You know, it's clear that uh, many of uh, the Afghan women who valued the freedom that they had secured, including the freedom to educate their kids, the freedom to work, the freedom to stand for elected office, you know, something like a third of elected officials in Afghanistan uh, prior to this were, were women, uh, are, are not going to lie down and simply accept Taliban rule and the the removal of all of those obligations. And we've seen lots of pictures of uh, women, uh, women's images being painted out uh, by uh, shop owners, it Let seems. It's not clear that that's actually been ordered by the Taliban. I think it's people sort of Health taking preventive measures on the assumption that uh, there are going to be prohibitions uh, against, against you know, images of women. You know, the, the fight is for uh, the Afghans now unfortunately, uh, and we have left them with very little resources, though there are, you know, additional government commitments for aid, which will need to be going presumably well, around the government rather than directly Singapore, to the government. I think swans, that's, you know, it's not just about Taliban getting people out of Afghanistan where we can, though I agree completely with Callum. It's also about thinking how we can support civil society organisations that are supporting women's that. rights, for example, uh, to, to try and hold on to some of those gains, which we know, you know, it's not just about whether you're a feminist or not. You know, we know that educating women and girls and protecting women and girls from violence is the way to secure economic growth and opportunity for everybody, including men. So if we can protect some of that for Afghanistan by supporting, by through aid and civil society, then, you know, there remains some glimmers of hope, I think. Let's look at our final paper for an overview of what this means to the British public. The I newspaper, UK public's verdict on Afghanistan exclusive. I'll just read the first line. Britain's 20-year mission in Afghanistan has been a waste of time and lives. Most they voters don't know believe the after the West's withdrawal. We've only got a minute and a half or so, so I'll give you 30 seconds each. Uh, Callum, your thoughts on this final? Yeah, well, I note that in that line as well, it's described as a panicked withdrawal, and I think that's probably accurate. I, I mean, opinion polls are what they are. I think what I, you know, what, what I get to when I read something like Hello, this, which is that um, 60% also say that the UK should give asylum to every Afghan who worked in the British military. But I think back to Aisha, who I spoke to on my programme live from Kabul on Sunday afternoon, as falling, and she said, everyone is thinking about how to escape or how to stay alive. And I think if you're ever asked a question about whether we should be helping people, think of what Aisha said to me at the weekend. Polly, your final thought? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 is, it feels like the end of that, that project of liberal interventionism, the idea that where human rights were being abused or where uh, democracy was not secured, that it was both the job and the obligation of the West to, to seek those causes, including through military means. 
that that was a project of of you know a generation and it's over the question i think is what do we do that's not just giving up on freedom on democracy and on women's rights we need something that's not about military gains but what about the papers will be bringing us Polly McKenzie, Callum McDonald, family. thank you both so much. I'll see you in about 40 day. minutes or so. That's it for the papers for now. They'll be back in just about 40 minutes for more of the stories. Goodbye.